Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we take deep dives into topics at the heart of the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today we will be learning about pervasive computing. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED34. All right, so pervasive computing is probably a phrase that you have not heard of before. It's, uh, it's, it's not one that comes into the public consciousness very often, um, but the basic, the big overview is that uh, this is the concept where we develop the necessary technology for computing to appear anytime and anywhere. Um, so you can think about this kind of in the frame of like it's the, it's the culmination of our move from uh, a model of many people using one computer which was the mainframe era right back when computers would be like there were just a handful of supercomputers that existed in the world um, each one of them had several experts right who like were trained in how to use this particular big old computer um, Computing was a very scarce resource back then, so even if you were, you know, some, like, professor, some researcher who uh, needed to use a computer to crunch a bunch of numbers, um, chances are you'd have to, like, approach one of the the technicians who is trained on how to use that particular um, computer and, and get them to, like, write a program for you, Um then after, so that's like the, the first paradigm of computing right there. Um, then we move into a one-to-one, -one, uh, the PC era, where most people who are using computers um, just have their own personal computer. Um, and so in that era, you've got your computer, it contains your stuff. Um, and when you're using your PC, right, you're occupied by whatever task you're doing on that PC and you're not really doing anything else. Um, so it's it's this it's computing as this kind of like discrete thing in our lives. Um, but it's actually a direct part of most people's lives unlike the previous era, uh, the many to one where you did not encounter uh, a computer in your in your day-to-day -day life pretty much ever. Uh, and then we transition into a one-to-many uh, era, which is this this pervasive computing era. Um, we're in the midst of transitioning from our the PC era to pervasive computing, but we're not quite there yet. And and you'll see over the course of this episode uh, why we're not um, quite there, even though we have like lots and lots of. Um, Internet of Things type technologies, right? You could put together um, a fairly cohesive like smart home uh, in 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 your life where a lot of the stuff happens just automatically around you. You don't need to do much of it. Um, but uh, as as you'll see, the concept goes a lot farther than that. Um, Mobile computing is kind of the stepping stone in between PC and pervasive computing. Um, and so pervasive computing is, is kind of seen as the successor to, to mobile computing. Um, a note on vocabulary. I'm calling this pervasive computing for the most part. There's a lot of different phrases that, that people use when they're referring to this type of thing. Um, ubiquitous computing is another big, uh, big phrase that's used. Um, and each of these phrases kind of has a different connotation to it, right? So, um, pervasive computing mostly just concerns, like the, the phrase pervasive computing is mostly concerned with like, are there computers available to you wherever you are, right? Um, ubiquitous computing is a little bit more kind of like, focused on the interaction between humans and those computers. Um, we also have other phrases like ambient intelligence, everywhere. I like everywhere because it's spelled different. It's every and then W-A-R-E, so like software or hardware, but it's everywhere. Um, physical computing, Internet of Things, I'm sure you've heard that one. Um, mostly Internet of Things refers to like inserting computing into household appliances usually. Um, haptic computing and uh, things that think.
All right, so what can we expect from a world where we have achieved pervasive computing? Um, well, we can expect to have small, inexpensive, robust network processing devices distributed at all scales throughout everyday life. So pretty much no matter where you are or what you're doing, um, there will always be some sort of computer that you won't really have to worry about, like um, knowing that it's there, it will surface itself when it's needed, right? Um, it'll bring whatever information to you that you need, um, probably before you even uh, need to ask for it. So one of the things about computing as it has existed up until today is that it was used for like a very particular subset of problems, right? It started off as a very um, like corporate, well, governments were using computers, uh, you know, to um, uh, to process a lot of you know information. Um, corporations started using computers for a lot of like financial stuff as well. Um, these days, yeah we as consumers, as individual people, we have started using computers um, not only for those things that, that were traditionally thought of as the, the realm of computers, but also for just all kinds of everyday um, problems, and not even problems, but also just like everyday annoyances, right? To solve our, our little problems, not just the big problems. And this brings me to the topic of uh, adoption of these technologies. It's uh, it is tempting to think of like about the fact that like okay, once this technology is possible, it will just automatically become like the default. But that's not necessarily true. Um, people generally. So I, I found this paper um, that had a lot of really good stuff to say about like why people use the technologies that they do. Um, and this paper actually was written way back in the year 2000. That's one of the interesting things about uh, researching pervasive computing is that it's a concept that was uh, talked about a lot in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, there hasn't been a whole lot of like explicit research into the area these days because we're, we're almost just almost living in an era of ubiquitous computing of pervasive computing um and so it's not it's because it's not like a novel thing anymore it's not like there isn't a whole lot of research being pushed forward uh regarding it most most of the research that's being done is on like specific technical problems um with regards to these technologies um but anyway this paper from from way back in the year 2000 um had some some pretty good stuff to say. Uh, one quote is, people generally do not adopt new technology merely because of its novelty, um, which is something that uh, I as an individual uh, have trouble, you know, wrapping my head around because like, that's my main um, motivation for, for trying out new types of technology is just, you know, to see what it is and see what this, how this new thing works. Another quote is, technology is a basic driver of pervasive computing, but people's behavior is the ultimate determinant, dictating unique factors by country, culture, and region. So uh, the example that they give there is that uh, if you live in a society where the norm is to drive to a store, such as here in the United States, right, the ability to order something online and have it delivered straight to you is a pretty big game changer. Uh, and I can definitely attest to that, right? I live in St. Paul, Minnesota. I do not own a car. Uh, and so that means that like shopping for me is a very different ball game than for people who own cars in this town. Uh, and so I do a lot more online shopping than I pr probably would if I owned a car, simply because it like it's not as time efficient for me to, to leave my house and go to a store and find what I need, um, as opposed to just like finding it immediately online and then having it delivered in one or two days. 
Um, contrast that to uh, if you live in a society where like the store is right outside of your door um, and their their example was in Japan uh, they have like a lot more mixed use neighborhood areas uh, and so there are a lot of like storefronts that are very very close to where you are physically um, in those kinds of situations ordering online may just seem redundant to most consumers so they won't use it uh, nearly as much Pervasive computing is going to require a variety of sensors and actuators uh, used in conjunction with each other and used in conjunction with, uh, you know, computer systems in order to accomplish tasks without direct intervention from the user. Um, so this is gets into a lot of like the um, automation type stuff that the Internet of Things is currently focused on, right? Um, Hopefully, it will allow humans to focus our attention on select aspects of the environment and operate in supervisory and policy-making roles. And that quote kind of really amuses me because it, it makes me feel like, oh, policy-making. I'm, I'm, you know, in charge of this little technological kingdom that I've created for myself, right? Um, but it, it does get at, like, the really important concept of human-centered computing, where computing is focused on serving the individual human, the person uh, who, who, you know, is, is using all of this stuff, um, as opposed to, like, um, computing for the sake of some other purpose. Um, and uh, Mark Weiser, who wrote a lot of really influential stuff about uh, pervasive computing back in the late 90s, um, he was influenced by fields other than computer science, such as philosophy, phenomenology, anthropology, psychology, postmodernism, sociology of science, and feminist criticism, which is like, wow, that is a very eclectic and also like very heavy hitting uh, collection of, of different of different uh, concepts. And it's definitely really important for us to start like using those to inform the systems that we create um, because otherwise uh, we're going to end up with a lot of systems that don't have the user's best interests at, my, at heart uh, and and I think we're, we're starting to see a lot of the really big consequences of that kind of thing um, where we have a lot of, of computer systems that we rely on uh, for various parts of our lives. But the companies that are, that are behind them, right, uh, have their own interests in, at heart, of course, uh, and not, uh, not their users. Thinking about human-centered computing in regards to what we currently have available to us, um, I, w I do think that smartphones do a pretty decent job of accomplishing a lot of tasks without like the user having to think about it. Um, so for example, like I don't have to tell my phone that I'm about to start a workout. Um, it just, you know, the accelerometer that's built into it senses that it's moving in a different way, that, I, that I'm moving my legs a lot faster than usual. Um, and that allows it to selectively go, okay, I'm gonna check the GPS and see how fast we're moving. Oh, we are moving pretty fast. Okay, okay, Ian's probably biking right now. Um, and so I think that, that that is a really good like example of a system that, that gets out of the user's way, but later on, I have this data at my fingertips that, um, you know, the, 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 the tracking information from my workout that I normally wouldn't have had if I didn't think about like actively tracking it. Um, so we need to use that that model of thinking um, for building a lot more of the systems that uh, that we use in our lives. Now, one thing that the smartphone centered world doesn't do very well um, is it it ties us to kind of one specific device still. Um, so, if you think about the PC era, right, that was um, the, the the hallmark of that era was one person using one computer um, and nobody else really 
gets to use that computer. Um, occasionally, you would have like you know a, a family that shares like one desktop computer, and so you've got um, several people who uh, have to negotiate who's going to use it at what time. Um, but yeah, still, this the smartphone era is very very similar to that still because each person has their phone that stays with them at all times right you carry it around in your pocket you carry it around in your purse um you very rarely leave it in a different room than where you are um and so that that's kind of the the hang up i think um because if we if we really achieve this world of pervasive computing then we won't any longer have to carry our own device around with us. Um, whatever devices happen to be around us will bring information to us uh, as we need it. Um, and and so in that kind of model, it's it's really it kind of ties into the concepts that we talked about uh, regarding the access economy back in episode twenty nine of the extra dimension, um, where you don't have to own a particular thing you don't have to worry about having it you just need to know that like okay i will be able to access this thing whenever i want to um and so really what 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 we're worrying about having access to in a world of pervasive computing is our data right um your data is the thing that's really valuable and what you truly own in this system um so yeah as long as like as long as I can access my playlist of podcasts or of music or uh, as long as I can access all of my the documents that I've written, right? I don't really need to care about whether or not I am using my own personal computing device. Um, and in some ways, in some ways, this is possible, you know, like I can go to the library and there are computers there that I can use to access pretty much all of my stuff because all of, all of my data is uh, off in the cloud and I just need to log in using a, a browser. Um, I can access all of my stuff when I'm at school, right? I don't own that computer. The school owns it. Um, but it's not, it's not quite to the level uh, that, that pervasive computing dictates, right? It, it doesn't fill the entire world. It's still in kind of discrete places. And this kind of model allows us to kind of flip around the way that we've traditionally thought of computing, right? So instead of escaping into a digital world to do our computing, um, computing will now augment the activities that we do in the physical world. Um, and you can think of this kind of like augmented reality versus virtual reality and the differences between those two. Um, but don't just limit yourself to thinking about those two examples, AR versus VR. Um, there's, you know, all kinds of different ways that uh, that pervasive computing is going to shift that relationship around. And for me personally, that kind of scares me a little bit because like that has been one of the defining aspects of my life is that I, I have long considered myself to be more of a, of a citizen of the, of the digital world than of any physical place here in, in the physical world. Um, it, you know, I, for the most part, I could, I could live just about anywhere it like, as long as I have good, consistent internet access. Um, and, uh, and so then like flipping that relationship around fills me with a lot of uncertainty. Um, but uh, I think that I'm a, an unusual example in regards to that. Once we have really immersed ourselves into a world of pervasive computing, the social impact of pervasive computing will be on the same scale as uh, the social impact of writing or of electricity or some other technology that just kind of fills our, our world uh, today. So if you think about like the way that we use writing and we use electricity, we don't ever think about it. Um, if we do think about it, it's a, it's a very rare occurrence, right? Um, it shows up all over the place. And, and there are tons and tons of other things that are built on top of it. Um, that's the kind of impact that we're looking at here when it comes to pervasive computing.
Now, there are a lot of challenges uh, for a pervasive computing world to come about. Um, if we start with the technology itself, right, there are a lot of system design and engineering challenges. Um, we fairly recently, and fairly by fairly recently, I mean, I guess, within the last 10 years, uh, have made the shift from um, the IPv4 to IPv6 um, addressing systems. So the IP addressing system, right, is, is the system that computers use to identify themselves on the uh, on the internet and uh, for information to be allowed to like be routed to a, a particular computer um, which is a, a very very important aspect of the uh, functionality of the internet right and it, the original addressing system um, or I guess it wasn't the original but uh, version 4 of the IP protocol, um, had, you know, it, it's got an upper limit to how many different addresses, uh, it can handle. And, uh, within the last 10 years, we made the switch over to IPv6, which can address, uh, more than a thousand devices for every atom on Earth's surface. Uh, and Mark Weiser says that we're going to need all of that. We're going to be using every single address uh, in, in, in the IPv6 space. Um, and when you, when you think about it in terms of like all, like a thousand devices for every atom on the earth's surface, like how is that even possible? How are we going to create that many devices? Um, well, I don't know exactly, but uh, I can, you know, if, if we think far enough into the future, we may have multiple different planets that we are uh, working on. We may have computing devices that don't just limit themselves to Earth's surface, right? Uh, and when we get down into the nanotechnology scale, we, we can almost have like one computing device per atom. Um, we probably can't get down quite that far, but you know, uh, we can have quite a few. User interface design is another big challenge uh, for pervasive computing, and this is kind of the big one that uh, technology companies are struggling with today. Um, traditional computer interface designs, uh, if you'll recall, we, we started off with kind of, uh, well, we started off with, with like punch cards and stuff like that, um, but for computers with, with like visual displays, uh, command line was, uh, was kind of the OG. Um, and then we, we have transitioned into menu based and graphical user interface, uh, systems, but most of those interfaces won't work for most of ubiquitous computing. Um, so we're going to have to figure out other things. Um, and since, since pervasive computing, like covers so many different, possible usage cases, um, I can imagine that there's going to be a lot of different interface types. Um, currently, the one that is kind of front and center, everybody's thinking about it, everybody's talking about it, is voice command interfaces. Um, and that is definitely in its growing pains phase right now. We still have a lot of times where um, our voice command assistants like don't understand what we're saying, or they may understand the words that we're saying, but they don't understand the exact intention behind it. Um, there are a lot of problems with like the user being able to figure out just by using that interface what is possible to do with that interface. Uh, and so we've, we've had a really amusing period where like, if I want to know all of the new functionality of my Google Home, right? If I want to know what abilities, what kinds of questions it can answer, what kinds of actions I can perform with it, I don't go to the Google Home to ask it to find out. I go to my phone or to my computer and I look it up in the app, right? Or I or I search online to see what other people uh, are saying you can do with this particular um, assistant device. 
Another kind of parallel example to voice command uh, systems is like um, chatbots because they are designed similarly to be kind of a, a like the actions that it performs come out of a conversation that you're having with it. Um, it is slightly different though because it is a visual interface uh, and it's not it's not nearly as time-based as a voice command system, right? Um, if I if I don't talk for a few seconds to my Google Home, it thinks, okay, he's not going to say anything. I can stop listening now. Um, whereas with like a chatbot, right, I can say something to it, it might respond, and then like I can come back to it 10 hours later and say something else, and like it's it's the same thread, it's the same conversation. We also have a couple of other emerging concepts for new user interfaces. Um, one one model is called the tangible user user interface, which is, uh, like uses physical objects and they're used to display digital information, and then um, that allows the user to manipulate the data via those physical objects. Um, this kind of thing is popular in educational settings because that gives the students, you know, multimodal feedback, um, and it and that aids in in retention uh, of the information that they're learning. Um, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see what like situations that kind of interface is appropriate in for the purposes of a of a pervasive computing world. Um, and then uh, natural user interface is another model. Um, and that's that's the concept of an interface that remains invisible to the user as they progress from novice to expert. Um, and in this case, natural refers to the goal of the user experience, um, not referring to the interface itself. So it doesn't have to be an interface that is like based on nature, right? It's not that kind of natural. It's just based on whether the the user can utilize this user interface without needing to be a, like w without needing to have like training on how it works. They, you know, you present them with this interface and off they go. And if we if we apply that concept back to uh, our voice command um, systems that are that are being uh, worked on right now, um, one of the big changes that has happened recently, uh, as of recording here in in July of 2018, right, is uh, for example on the Google Home, they um, recently introduced the feature uh, where you can have a continued conversation with the device. Um, it used to be that you would have to say the hot words to activate the Google Home every time that you want to say something to it. Um, but now it will, like after you say something to it and it responds, it will then listen to you again to see what else you want uh, it to do. Um, and they also put a lot of effort into uh, having it remember what what the previous conversation, what the previous parts of the conversation were about, so that uh, you can reference those, not explicitly, but implicitly, um, and have it performed uh, perform those actions. So for example, the other day, um, I wanted to listen to some music in my kitchen, but my mom was using my phone to call my dad. Um, and I knew... I knew that I wanted to listen to a particular album, but I couldn't remember the name of that album. So I asked it, um, what album is the song Sly by the Cat Empire from? And it told me, Two Shoes. And so I told it, play that. And it pl started playing the uh, the album. Um, so I didn't have to explicitly say which album I wanted it to play. It knew because that was the album that we had just been talking about. Now, one of the big challenges of designing this kind of natural interface is that the default settings must be as close to the user's desires as possible so that they don't have to explicitly go in and make a whole bunch of changes. Um, and I don't think that that's going to be 100% possible because the, like, there are many, many different people who are going to be using these systems. We all have different um, desires, different motivations, right? We're going to want different um, 
different default settings uh, in in these systems. And so that's going to be a huge challenge is, is how do you determine what are the default settings that should be there, but also how can this interface gracefully change its settings without the user having to explicitly go in and change those settings on their own. A big challenge with these type of interfaces is avoiding the computer sensing false positives. Um, so with a lot of these systems, right, they're, they're trying to base what the computer does on something that, that the user does in the real world. Um, and so how, how is the computer going to determine whether a particular action was actually um, directed at them or if I'm just doing that thing completely independent of my desire to interact with the computer, right? So one example would be uh, saying the hot words, right? If I want to activate the Google Home, I would say, okay, Google. And so it starts listening to me. But in this case, I don't actually want to talk to it. I just want uh, to say that as an example in this podcast. And I may have just activated other people's Google Homes as well uh, who are listening to this podcast. Apologies to everybody who that happened to. Um, but that that's a, a really good illustration of like how do we separate out those two things. Um, and this hasn't been a problem with traditional computer interfaces really because like it's a pretty safe assumption in a desktop computer environment that whenever I'm touching the mouse, whenever I'm moving the mouse or clicking those buttons, whenever I'm pressing any of the keys on the keyboard, that I am intending for the computer to interpret those as commands because there is no other reason in the world for me to be touching the mouse or manipulating the keyboard, right? Um, I'm sure that you can think of a few other reasons for me to be doing that, but like very, very, very few scenarios where I would be um, messing around with the control devices for my desktop computer without actually wanting my desktop to do something. Um, phones as well uh, have have this advantage, right? That like anything, most things that I want to do with my phone, I do via the touch screen. And it's pretty easy to avoid touching the touch screen if I don't want to do something with the phone. Um, now, there are a few more times where I where I have I accidentally touch the screen on the phone without intending to, um, and actually, almost a hundred percent of the times that I hand my phone to my mom, that happens. Um, so you know that like that's an example of kind of the in between um, where we're we're transitioning into a user interface that has more possibilities for false positives. Um, but then when we get into, yeah, voice command systems or systems that are sensing like, um, for example, the connect, right? Where it, it's sensing my body movements. Um, I may like, how do I transition from being in front of the connect and controlling a game to not being in front of the connect and controlling a game without the connect interpreting my movements as part of the game or something like that, right? Um, so that's uh, that's a, a an area that's definitely going to have to be worked on. Another big change that we're going to have to make to user interfaces is that uh, traditionally, all of the user interfaces that we have striven to create uh, were basically in service of like creating these dramatic machines that people want to use that they don't want to be without. Um, and pervasive computing emphasizes like the creation of invisible machines that people like use without thinking about um and so the the phrasing that mark weiser used uh in his research back in the 90s was that this technology should be calm technology and it should be out of the way um and so his proposal is that uh in order for a technology to to be a calm one is that it must be able to fluidly move from the periphery of our attention into the center of our attention and then back again. Um, so his example was that um, when you're like driving a car, the you don't think about the sound of the engine while you're driving unless 
it sounds different, unless it sounds off, right? In which case you immediately start paying attention to the sound uh, in order to try to diagnose what is wrong with it. So that's an example of something that moves fluidly from the periphery of our attention into the center of our attention. Um, and then if it goes back to sounding normal, then it goes back into the, the periphery, right? Um, and And you can you can see like how this makes a lot of sense because if everything wanted to be the center of our attention, it would be overwhelming. Um, but we can, we can be attentive to many, many different things all at once, as long as they're just kind of peripherally, uh, part of our environment. And when we, when we successfully set up a, a bunch of different interfaces, right, that are just peripherally a part of our, of our environment, um, when our peripheral attention is functioning well, then we can be tuned into what's happening around us. Um, and also we can get clues as to what's going to happen, what just happened, stuff like that. Um, and, and this really like digs into the, the ultimate goal of technology is that, um, like good technology gets out of the way of the task being performed. Um, so you could think about this uh, in terms of like riding a really nice bike versus a bike that needs a tune-up, right? You're not going to really notice how nice the bike is that you're riding unless it unless there's something wrong with it, right? Moving on from user interfaces, um, privacy is another huge, huge aspect that's going to be have to be kind of reimagined for this world of pervasive computing. Um, because as you as you can as we're thinking about this, right? If if we're thinking about this in the context of a world where I don't have to, I I don't own most of the devices that I am interacting with that that this informa information is coming to me f uh, via then like who controls that data where does it where does it ultimately live how do i prevent unknown and unauthorized parties from making copies of the of my personal data uh while still allowing me to access all of that data whenever i want to we also have to really ask ourselves whether or not the user's privacy expectations match up with current industry industry sand standards and um, the privacy principles that experts uh, operate under. We also have become aware of the fact uh, that the like one user's privacy is often dependent on the privacy settings of others, um, and we rather rudely became uh, hit over the head with this problem uh, via Cambridge Analytica. Um, so thanks to that whole situation for bringing this uh, this problem to the uh, to the spotlight. Um, and I I have the beginnings of an idea for how this kind of like privacy settings like difficulty can be can be navigated um in a, in a pervasive computing world i don't think that it is going to be feasible for the user to go and set every single privacy setting individually um and and for every single conceivable scenario um so what we could do is um present like a user with a few example scenarios and ask them like who they would be comfortable with their personal data being available to what kinds of uh things would they would you know where would they like their data to go how would they like it to be used etc um and then based on their answers to those example scenarios, extrapolate what their answers to other scenarios likely would be. Um, and, you know, of course, I'm not designing explicitly like an algorithm to to handle this. But like I, I imagine that you could statistically figure out what a uh, what a particular user's um, priorities are and what what their what their. Um, privacy settings likely would be for other scenarios based on uh, a few examples.
Another big challenge for pervasive computing, um, and one that we have seen, uh, especially in the Internet of Things arena, is updates and security. Um, so one, in, in some ways, it's going to be a little bit easier um, because users are the like the end users are typically not involved in the update process in this pervasive computing world um and so these you know internet of things devices um they they have to be online constantly for them to be truly useful so given those two facts um it's it's much more likely that like when the manufacturer when the developers push out an update to those devices, most of those devices will be able to install it immediately. Contrast this with the way that updates work on our PCs or on our phones, right? It interrupts the user, it asks them, hey, do you want to install a an update right now? And many, many, many users say, no, not right now, because like when they are using the device and it interrupts them, they don't want to, it to restart right in that moment because they are using it. Um, and, uh, and so those updates can sometimes get deferred for a very, very long time. Um, but contrast that with uh, most of the um, Internet of Things devices that I have in my house, I don't even know when they update. Um, I they, they just sit there and uh, I, I can't tell you if they have restarted or not. They... they they just do. The con is that there isn't much incentive built into like the the economic system around Internet of Things currently um, for for Internet of Things uh, manufacturers to rigorously send out updates and maintain security and whatnot. So I I think that we have some work to do there in terms of like incentivizing the security of these devices um and i i don't have a great answer for for what that incentive structure could be short of just you know a subscription service the end user having to pay a monthly fee in order to like encourage the the developer to continue working on it um, and enabling that right because it's very difficult to continue to to uh, develop software if you don't have a continuous um continuous source of income so yeah we we definitely need to figure out an economic model that can support that I would like to finish off this episode with um, a few tips for how how we should approach this new world, um, how, like how best to organize our digital lives um, so that we can be ready for the world of pervasive computing um, as as it uh, step by step enters our world. Um, so. The most important thing is definitely our data, right? Um, your personal data is the thing that is going to to stay with you, hopefully, if you're doing everything correctly, stay with you from device to device, right? And so, so given that, um, my priority whenever I'm choosing uh, where my data goes, I always choose systems and platforms that do the following. Um, these, these are like my kind of overall guiding criteria for how I choose uh, my, my software platforms. My data should be accessible from all of my devices and should sync from one device to another whenever possible. So basically, whenever, whenever any of my computing devices are connected to the internet, um, it's, it's synchronizing my data. Um, and so, of course, that means that I need to choose services that are available on many, many different platforms, right? So um, I probably wouldn't use, uh, you know, if, if, if I have um, a particular device that has some, let's see, let's give a good example. Um, I like to listen to a lot of podcasts, and so uh, and I have an Android device, so I could be using the built-in Google Podcast app, right? But that podcast app is not available on 
uh, anything other than Android. So I wouldn't be able to listen to my podcasts on, um, well, it is available on Android and on my Google Home devices, right? But it's not available on my Windows desktop. It's not available on the MacBook that I use for school. It's not available on the iPad that I use for school, um, right? So, so I would prioritize finding a podcast player that is actually available on as many of the devices that I use as possible. Um, also, my data should be easily exported and be, uh, and I should be able to move it over to other platforms um, because, like, I own that data, right? Um, and and I need to be able to go from from one, like, if I was tied down to to one particular um, platform, then I'm completely at their mercy. They can do whatever they want, right? And I will never leave because then I would lose all of my data, um, and so. Because of that, I try to use as many platforms, as, well, as many systems that are like decentralized and open as possible. Um, and uh, and I talked with Brian a lot about that uh, in our last episode of The Extra Dimension uh, when we talked about decentralized publishing. Um, but also, uh, this ties into the GDPR, um, which we talked about back in episode 32 of The Extra Dimension, um, because one of the clauses in the GDPR law is that um, software companies uh, must provide like an industry standard format for people to export their data, their personal data, um, so that they can then import it into other systems um, if they if they wish to do that, which I love. That is That is a huge, huge step. Now, uh, the devices that I use, that we use, in, uh, are going to be secondary to the software platforms, but they are still important. Um, so, we want to select devices that have broad third-party support and don't lock us into their ecosystems, right? Um, for the same reason that we don't want to be locked into a software uh, platform, we also don't want to be locked into a hardware platform simply based on like um, the the first party like applications that are available there um, because if if that is a draw of a hardware platform then that means that that software is inherently not going to be available on all of the different platforms that we could possibly uh, want to use so um, yeah so I try to treat every device that I use as basically a thin client. It, it is just providing a window for me to view my data. Um, but that data doesn't live solely on that device. So if I lose that particular device, then it doesn't really matter to me. I mean, obviously I'm going to be out a few hundred dollars to get a new device. Um, but I don't actually lose any of the stuff that I had on that device um, because all of my data like lives elsewhere. It lives currently we would say, you know, it lives in the cloud. Um, I don't know if that phrase is going to change over time, uh, but yeah. Now, I definitely prefer general purpose computing devices over single purpose computing devices. Um, Partially for, for, for both of those those aforementioned uh, priorities that all of my data must be available on all of my different um, devices um, and that I don't want my each individual device to have like a, a software ecosystem that tries to keep me in there. Um, and it is possible to find single purpose computing devices that that, you know, use open systems, open platforms, um, but they're a lot less common. Um, and so I take I take this priority uh, a bit to the extreme, um, and it, it, it results in the fact that, like, I don't own any dedicated gaming devices, for example. Um, I do all of my gaming on my PC or on my Android phone. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I probably won't ever own an actual console. There are some things that could convince me uh, to use other single-purpose devices, right? In particular, um, I think that uh, single-purpose devices could really help us to, um, like, increase our focus on whatever task we're doing. 
Um, but I'll get into that a little bit later when I talk about collapsing contexts. Uh, and of course, there are some tasks that are going to work on certain devices and aren't going to work on others um, simply due to like the nature of those devices. Um, for example, I probably would not ever edit a podcast episode on my phone because the interface just isn't appropriate for that. The screen is far too small for me to be able to um, make the, the kinds of minute changes that I want to, uh, to, to an audio file. Um, but at the same time, like, I don't use my desktop for everything, right? I wouldn't go and track my workout activities with my desktop because, like, it's heavy. I can't take it with me. And it also doesn't have the right sensors for that. So, um, yeah, so so each each device according to its ability, but within that device's category, um, I try to choose the, the most... The devices that will that will have like the broadest uses uh, that aren't like just specifically for one thing, um, and you know a lot of that motivation is also just cost because it costs a lot less to have one six hundred dollar phone than it does to have like a one hundred dollar GPS and a one hundred dollar um, e reader and a one hundred dollar um, you know, voice caller, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I also try to seek out platforms and devices that interoperate with other platforms and devices nicely, um, usually via APIs. So for example, um, like if I have a Google Home in my in my house and I have an Amazon Fire TV stick plugged into my television, um, then I won't be able to use them together, right? I won't be able to just call out to the Google Home and tell it to start playing something on the TV. Um, I can only do that if I have a Chromecast plugged into the TV. Um, so in that way, like the, the Internet of Things, the smart home arena is definitely... A series of different like kind of closed loops closed systems um, but uh, but not entirely right because you can find a lot of like um, hue light bulbs for example uh, they are a third-party company and they have partnerships with both Amazon and with Google so it doesn't matter whether you have a Google home or uh, an echo device um, and so evaluating like doing your research and figuring out what things each service, each platform, each device is going to be interoperable with um, can really get tedious very, very quickly. Um, and so what I like to do is, is a good proxy is just check to see if that particular platform has hooks into IFTTT. Um, and IFTTT is a great, great system. Um, it stands for If This Then That. And it's uh, it's basically a website where you can go and like um, connect your IFTTT account to a whole bunch of other accounts from other different platforms um, and create events that will happen if another event happens first so for example here on the nexus right um i have a bunch of different um ifttt recipes set up where whenever we um publish a new episode on any of our shows then it will tweet about it it will post on facebook it will post to our subreddit it it, it like automates a, a significant chunk of that process um in terms of like smart home type stuff, you can go and uh, create a whole bunch of different things that will uh, connect different parts of your of like different different devices that might have slightly different platforms, and uh, and then even if they don't have like direct partnerships with each other, um, you should still be able to create these these recipes on IFTTT that um, that will connect two different things to each other. Now, as I said before, um, I try to use systems that will allow me to do just about any action right on any device so it doesn't matter whether i'm using my phone or my desktop or somebody else's desktop or whatever um 
and for some for some things those are easier than others right um it's it's like it's very very easy for me to access my email on all of my different devices um however text messages are an entirely different um different scenario right and uh and that's you know a historic reason because texting was traditionally just administrated by the cell phone carrier and so that's kind of the same world that we live in today um and so most people right if they receive a text message they'll only get it on their phone that's the only device that they can ever access them on when you lose that phone all the text messages that are stored there uh go away and um and so there and and you know there's there's not much we can do about it except there is um there are some platforms that will allow you to text from computers using uh, various different means. Um, I was very fortunate that I, uh, my parents did not buy me a cell phone uh, for long enough that like I went and found Google Voice uh, on my own. And Google Voice is, is a great system that allows me to text message or make calls from any computer that is connected to the internet. Um, and so that has kind of followed me throughout my life. Uh, I still have right the same phone number that I've always had. Um, and it doesn't matter if I like switch carriers or anything because my text messages and my phone calls don't live through that uh, cell phone carrier, they live through my Google account. Um, now that, that does mean that I'm more reliant on my Google account, but, um, I definitely already was reliant on my Google account for basically everything anyway, because, um, Google, Google accounts fit all of the criteria that I've named so far. So, um, that's where, like, that's the system that I have kind of selected for myself over the years. Um, another, and, and there are lots of other like platforms that you could use to text from a computer. Um, I haven't looked into most of them because like Google voice does that for me already. Um, but there, there are ways to, even if you, if, if you're receiving text messages through your, uh, cell phone carrier, uh, to get those text messages to show up on your computer as well. Um, and one that I'm aware of is Pushbullet, um, and Pushbullet does a lot more than just allowing you to get your text messages on your computer. It also allows you to have notifications uh, from one device show up on all of your other devices, um, mostly used, I think, for mirroring your phone's notifications up onto your desktop computer or your laptop computer. Um, but it'll also let you um, respond to text messages uh, if your phone is on Android, I think. I'm not sure about iOS because iOS is a little bit more uh, locked down. Um, but also Pushbullet lets you like m just move files and uh, and links and stuff from one, one uh, device to another. You just push it on over. It's pretty cool. Uh, and finally, a big, big problem that we're that we're finding uh, now that we've got, especially in in our mobile centric world, um, this is still going to be a problem, I think, in in the world of pervasive computing. Um, but this is definitely a, a problem that we need to address today. Is that pervasive computing um, collapses contexts? And if you Google search for collapsing context you're going to find a whole bunch of stuff about like social media and how um when we when we're talking with other people on social media we don't know like what context they're in when they're writing it and when they're reading it and stuff like that um i'm not talking about it in that regard um what i'm talking about is that the information that we're receiving that's coming at us uh via our digital devices um, doesn't really worry about what context we are in currently in like physical space. Um, and so I, you know, you, you can get a lot of notifications, uh, of things that you need to address, but you're just not currently in a good place to address them. Right. Um, whether that's just like you're driving and so you can't address any notifications because you you of course are a good person and don't look at your phone while you're driving um but also in terms of like 
you might be uh, at work and you're supposed to be getting work done, but then, you know, you're getting notifications on your phone of, like, your friends who are messaging you and it's not work-related, but, like, you know, hey, are you going to ignore your friend? Um, It also goes the other way, right? That uh, um, some people are having trouble, like, leaving work at work because if you can still receive all of your emails delivered straight to you in your pocket, like, how do you... Uh, spend time with your family or, you know, like how do you achieve that work-life balance um, in, in this, in this uh, scenario where, yeah, work can follow you wherever you go. Um, And, uh, and yeah, so because of this, uh, one of, one of my friends once told me that, uh, yeah, smartphones are probably the greatest invention that capitalism could have hoped for. uh, And I think that that's the the best way of putting it. Um, So, so how, like what what methods can we use for separating work and play? Um, we definitely have to be much more intentional about it, I think, than most people have been uh, in the past. Um, and of course, I'm not like each individual person probably has a completely different like approach to this. Um, we we could have completely discrete devices for each individual thing that we're going to be doing. Um, I don't think that that's like a super great solution, a super sustainable solution, because like, I don't know about you, but like, I can't afford to have entirely different device. You know, I, I can't afford to have like a separate thing for me to read books on and a separate thing for me to listen to music on and a separate thing for me to work on stuff for work on and different you know, device for me to edit podcasts on versus the one that I can get notifications on and stuff like that. So for, for me personally, uh, for separating my, the work that I do for school from the rest of my life, um, hasn't been too difficult because like school does give me, uh, a computer for me to do school work on. And so I can set that up to receive notifications and stuff. Um, and then it, it is its own discrete device. Um, but like, I also can log into my school accounts, uh, from any computer and work on stuff from any computer. Um, but the important part is that like by default, I'm not, especially for like work emails, right? I'm, I'm not logged into that on my phone, uh, and I, and I don't get notifications for that. Um, I can, I can selectively log into that from my phone if I ever do need to check those. Um, but that's me proactively going to that information. Um, and then the flip side of course, is when I'm at school, uh, I have my phone in do not disturb so that it doesn't, uh, distract me, you know, while I'm, while I'm trying to teach. Um, I probably should also put my smartwatch into quiet mode, Um, but, like, I've decided for myself that I can just handle having my wrist buzz every once in a while, and, you know, my students can't hear it, so it's fine. Um, I probably should disable push bullet on my work computer, because, like, yeah, if I'm sitting there trying to get work done, uh, I don't need to have my phone's notifications popping up on the screen in front of me and distracting me. That is something that I do struggle with. Um, I don't have a very good solution for my, for the other side, my, my podcasting work-life balance, because like, I like podcasting so much that like, it's kind of what I do for fun. But like, at the same time, if I'm hanging out with my housemates, like they don't need me to just be sitting there working on podcasting stuff while I'm trying to hang out with them. You know, they like, I don't need to be getting notifications about people who are interacting with the Nexus TV on Twitter, but I totally do because I enjoy it. Uh, so yeah, it's, there's some places where I'm doing pretty well for work-life balance and some places where I'm not. I fully admit that. Um, and then, yeah, like, my personal email account is, I think, a really good example of this kind of balance because, like, a lot of different things flow into that email address. Um, You know, I I get individual people who are emailing me who I know in real life who uh, want to talk about something. And so I definitely want to get notifications about those messages because I can treat those as just, like, it's basically an instant messaging platform at that point. Um, but I definitely don't want to get notifications about 
every single like uh political email right for for whatever candidate wants me to support them at the primaries so 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 i really need to rely on the email system that i use to make those choices for me and i think that that's the kind of thing that our pervasive computing world is going to do more and more of is like like making these choices for the user in a way that the user will probably like um but of course it can it can't know for sure unless we explicitly tell it um and so there's probably going to be hiccups there's probably going to be some ways that it doesn't quite do what we want it to um but i think that overall it's going to uh improve improve the quality of our lives uh by quite a bit um by kind of bringing appropriate information to us according to what situation we're currently in um and then you of course can proactively go and get whatever information from this pervasive computing system that you need that you want so yeah that's pervasive computing i think it's a really fun i really enjoy thinking about these like kind of near future uh things because it's it's a lot more tangible, um, but still uh, gives us some some good opportunities to imagine a world that we don't uh, we don't currently quite live in yet. I have been your host, Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. The Extra Dimension is a production of the Nexus TV. You can find us on Twitter at the Nexus TV, um, or take a look at all of our other shows at the Nexus TV. This episode is uh, released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so feel free to uh, take any part of it and do whatever you want with it and use it however you want, uh, as long as you link back to the original at thenexus.tv slash TED34. If you would like to discuss this episode with other listeners, you can go to our subreddit at uh, r slash thenexustv. And if you would like to help support us as we uh, make more technology-focused educational content, you can go to our Patreon at patreon.com slash thenexustv. You can get some fun rewards over there like Nexus stickers, and you can uh, help us to choose what topics we're going to cover on the Nexus or on the Extra Dimension. Um, This particular episode was actually chosen by our supporters on Patreon. And remember that no matter where you're listening to this episode, you should definitely go in your favorite podcast player and subscribe to The Extra Dimension to get new episodes as soon as they're released. Thanks for listening. Have a good one.